Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and in this last portion of my analysis of an excerpting of the book Blood Oath uh, about an alleged white supremacist conspiracy to murder Nicole Brown Simpson, and uh, well, Ron Goldman was killed uh, by accident. Uh, the book is authored by Stephen Worth and Carl Jaspers, published in soft cover by the Rainbow Press, by Rainbow Books, and copyrighted in 1996. I say alleged because the information comes from an anonymous informant and has not been positively confirmed. I suspect that there is a little bit of disinformation in the book. I also suspect that the vast bulk of the information is right on the money. And indeed, uh, the informant says basically this operation was a Nazi psyop in effect, uh, and uh, that is precisely what I have been saying for a long, long time. Obviously, the fact that I've been saying it doesn't necessarily make it true. Make it true. I suspect that the uh, account presented here is uh, overwhelmingly accurate, although there may be some disinformation secreted in there. Indeed, there are some indications that may be the case. The authors have the same suspicion. What I'm going to do now is to read the minute-by-minute -minute chronology as reconstructed from uh, the notes that Skinner gave to the authors of the execution of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. I want to warn listeners that this is some very, very strong stuff. Uh, not for the faint-hearted. This is a very disturbing description. Again, the actual execution of Operation Thunderbolt went down as follows. Bear in mind that both OJ's and Nicole's places were being surveilled physically and electronically by three-man teams, and that the teams were in uh, constant real-time communication with each other uh, through a remote, secure, a secure mobile communication system. They had communicators, and uh, their communications were scrambled. The actual account of the killings goes as follows. A screenwriter would have had great difficulty creating all of the actions that day that were played in separate locations at precisely the same time. The time sequence has been reconstructed from notes and Skinner's best recollections of the day's activities. At 0600 hours, O.J. Simpson packed his tools of play into a golf cart at the Riviera Country, at the Riviera Country Club, determined once again to master the game he loved. Over on the west side... Our strike team packed its tools of play into a car, a van, and a white Bronco. We were equally determined to accomplish our goal in the name of the master race, the execution of the only other thing O.J. truly loved. Our mission clock had begun its countdown at dawn. When our clothes and personal items were stowed in the van, Grip and I paused and stepped back from the vehicle. We glanced at each other. A reverent calm fell over us. Each knew the other was remembering Thumper's words from the canyon. Out of these ashes shall rise our new nation, unquote. We met the others for a leisurely breakfast at Norm's on Sepulveda. I was surprised to see the enforcer all decked out in a natty new suit. He looked like a lawyer. He said he always got dressed up for an important action, and besides, Blade and Speedy are making the hit. All he's got to do is stand and watch. Over coffee, we reviewed critical mission times once again. One, O.J.'s limo pickup approximately 2245. That's uh, at 1045. Two, flight leaves L.A. International 2345. Three, travel time from Bundy to Rockingham, 10 minutes. Four, take out Nicole and possibly her guest no more than 15 minutes, 20 minutes max. Five, remove all traces of bugs another 10 to 20 minutes. Six, Plant evidence at Bundy scene and then at the fortress after the hit. Again, the fortress is a, they're the conspirators' code name for O.J.'s uh, residence. Seven, bang Cato's wall no later than 2240. Remember, the limo arrives at 2245. That allows O.J. five minutes to get in the house for the pickup. Of course, he'll already be inside waiting, maybe even napping. The cops must determine there's sufficient time for him to get inside to meet the limo. Eight. Once he's left for the airport, we'll have time to plant blood inside the Bronco and remove the bugs. After going over the timing, I relayed the deliverer's orders. He informed me of a meeting he would be having with the dark German today, appraising him of the final plans. Here's a few of the orders that I remember giving to the strike team. Again, the dark German is the code name for the LAPD insider who directed the investigation in the direction of O.J. Everyone except Blade wears surgical gloves from the time the operations begin at both locations until they are completely over. Blade will wear the leather gloves and the watch cap we lifted at the fortress. The shoes we took at the same time will sh show only on one person. Blade, your size ten and a half foot, will fit a little loose, but with a couple of pair of heavy socks and OJ's socks on top, you'll be all right. 
I don't expect you to be dancing, but be careful you don't lose one. Sock prints would look bad. When you're inside the gated area of Bundy, everyone but Blade will wear the shoe protectors. Almost forgot the dogs. We should have listened to the deliverer's suggestion of getting dogs to look like we belonged. Grip jokingly remarked, Hell, our dogs could have kept their dogs company while we took care of business. Now we might have to tranquilize them with the gun. By the way, this is a tranquilizer gun that was used to neutralize the dogs. Damn, I hope it don't hurt them. Can't stand to see animals in pain, Blade muttered. Blade loses the glove and cap on the sight. After he's done that, he'll plant a couple of drops from the hypo containing O.J.'s blood. You guys don't forget her evening visitor, her lover. He's been thoughtful enough to keep her at home. We've got the perfect setup. O.J. finds Lover and Nicole together under the stars and in a rage brutalizes them. At the completion of the assignment, Blade and Speedy will calmly exit the scene and drive back here so we can switch Broncos and plant some of Nicole's blood, some bloody clothes, and Blade's other glove. Back at Bundy, Thumper and the Enforcer will stay on to remove the bugs and make sure the bodies are found. Thumper, you better go up the pole. I don't think the Enforcer will be able to make that in that fancy suit. Each team's been given their departure route. Thumper and the Enforcer will be taking the 405 to the 101 towards Oxnard and up the coast. Blade, you and Speedy will be traveling up the 405 to the 5 and straight north. Me and Grip are heading back towards Barstow and up 15 to Vegas, unquote. Before we wrote, broke ranks for our designated posts, I asked if there were any questions or areas that had not been covered. Do we abort the mission if the timeline provides an alibi for O.J.? Or do we gamble on the planet evidence being overwhelming, Thumper asked. Abort, abort, abort. Wait for a, we'll wait for a better time, was my response. With that in mind, work hard and smart. Let's complete our mission. Good luck and Godspeed. Grip and I headed for our favorite spot on Sunset Boulevard to monitor the intercom and telephone traffic at the fortress. Thumper and the enforcer parked the Taurus near San Vicente to quietly monitor the Bundy residence. It was going to be a long day but we were all full of energy. The white Ford Bronco was parked inside the garage underneath Blades and Speedy's safe house. They would not leave until later tonight to prevent any unnecessary exposure. They were left alone to prepare for their night of stealth and doom. The clothing they selected for the night mission were jumpsuits with snaps, the kind worn by service personnel. The material was a dark blue, almost black cotton type of fabric. It's a familiar garment to those involved in similar actions. One of the most ingenious articles of deception was demonstrated by Blade. He did it about noon. It scared the hell out of Speedy. Speedy was intently honing the coated steel blade of his, his official SOG Navy Seal two and a quarter inch knife to a paper slicing sharpness. His concentration was abruptly interrupted by an aberration in his peripheral vision. Jumping to his feet, Speedy dropped the honing stone and instinctively held his knife in an off offensive position. Then, just as quickly, he yelled, What the blank? Where the hell did you get that mask? I thought for a moment that O.J. had gotten to me, unquote. By the way, I just want to interject uh, ever so briefly, hearkening back to the previous segment. Uh, this group used highly sophisticated codes, and uh, some of the coincidental uh, observations, or observations about coincidence, such as SOG, Special Operations Group, uh, the part of the name of the Navy SEAL knife that they used, and Sons of Gestapo might seem preposterous to some. But again, this group is highly sophisticated, steeped in intelligence and military methodology, and they use a very sophisticated coding system. And uh, I don't think those are unreasonable questions to ask in light of their coding system, which is detailed by the authors. And again, uh, it, there may be nothing to it. Continuing. The deliverer thought this could be the coup de grace. He had made it by a kinsman who makes puppets. He had it made by a kinsman who makes puppets. I'll only be wearing it in the Bronco when we head back into the fortress and after taking out Nicole and her bedmate. People see what they expect to see. The eyes play tricks. There's always the chance someone will spot the Bronco on the way back and they'll swear they saw O.J. in a hurry, unquote. It was 1,400 hours in time for Blade and Speedy to receive an update on the current location of Nicole and O.J., the calls came in on time from both locations. Rockingham called in first at 1400 exactly. O.J. hasn't come back yet. There's very little car traffic around the area and minor pedestrian, unquote. Bundy reported in a, reported in a minute or so later. Nothing to report. She came back with the kids and some bags a while ago. She's still inside, unquote. 
The second secure call from Bundy came in at 1,500 hours. Thumper informed Speedy, quote, I intercepted a phone call at Nicole's from O.J. He bitched about the right to see more of his kids. It was made just after my last report. Next report at 1630 hours. 1600 hours, Grip reported O.J.'s home and calling some woman named Tracy. Normal B.S., unquote. 1635 hours, the enforcer checked in with his report. Nicole just left, probably for Paul Revere Jr. High. She's wearing a sexy little black thing, unquote. 1,650 hours. Blade had barely finished with the enforcer when Speedy related, quote, O.J.'s left the fortress in his Bentley, unquote. 1,730 hours. Thumper and the enforcer watched patiently outside the junior high, reporting no activity. 1,800 hours. Thumper reported, quote, The crowd's starting to thin out. I'll stay on the line until I can spot Nicole and O.J., unquote. 1,815 hours. Thumper notified Blade he could see them and that shortly thereafter they both took off. Quote, We're going to tail Nicole and family. O.J.'s probably heading back to the fortress. You and Grip pick him up there. 1855 hours. As O.J. drove by, I commented, quote, He's back, unquote. I followed him slowly up Rockingham and parked about a block away from the fortress. 1935 hours. O.J.'s using his toy again, called some woman, left a message telling her he's going out of town on a late-night flight. The guy's always on the make, unquote, was Grip's remark. 1940 hours. Thumper reported, Nicole and family are all eating at the Mezzaluna restaurant. That enforcer's got some balls. He went strolling past on the sidewalk and looked in. Said she was eating something that looked like rigatoni, unquote. 1940 hours. Speedy and Blade made their final preparations. They donned jeans under their jumpsuits and loose-fitting dark-colored short-sleeved shirts over them. They checked their equipment and tested their hands-free personal communications devices. Eager to get in on the cat and mouse games and looking for something to do to take the edge off their tension, they decided to do some cruising right after my latest report. I was pissed. It went against, order, it went against orders and good sense. If anyone had seen a white Bronco chasing a white Bronco, or if they had been stopped, it could have doomed the mission. Hey, Skinner, O.J. just took off in his Bronco. We're going to follow him, unquote, radioed Speedy. Then he turned his receiver off so he couldn't hear any reply. A little while later, he came back with, Don't worry, we're following at a safe distance. He's driving along Wilshire. He stopped, and now he's driving again. Looks like we're heading back towards Rockingham, unquote. Two thousand hours. I told Blade and Speedy in no uncertain terms to get over to the Westward Hole Market and park in a non-conspicuous spot. 2007 hours, or 2007 hours, he's back in the house again. 2010 hours, I reported spotting that same older woman before, walking a dog that looked like a golden retriever, headed toward the Rockingham Gate area. 2020 hours, the little old lady left. 2030 hours, Nicole and family left the Mezzaluna. 2050 hours, O.J. just walked back to Cato's room, unquote. 2100 hours. Now, both of them have come up to the house, unquote. 2105 hours. O.J. made an unextraordinary phone call to Christian Reichardt, Faye's boyfriend. They joked about sports. 2115 hours. I notified Blade that O.J. left with Cato, which concerned me, but his Bronco was outside and exposed. 2020, 2120 hours. Thumper and the enforcer reported that Nicole arrived home at Bundy but not before the enforcer had followed her into Ben and Jerry's and tried to make small talk with her as she bought ice cream. I was worried the whole plan was falling apart because of the flakiness of my kinsman under pressure. 2125 hours. Blade and Speedy have repositioned themselves closer to the fortress and are waiting to switch Broncos. 2140 hours. O.J. returned with Cato. The kid had some food in his hand and headed towards his room. O.J. was just standing around. 2150 hours. Thumper excitedly called Blade. That Jew Goldman is bringing Nicole's mother's eyeglasses over, unquote. Blade answered back, My dreams are answered. The Jew will need more than glasses to see another day, unquote. 2154 hours. Grip motioned to me. Grip motioned to me. O.J. just walked outside and took something out of the Bronco. It was a small cellular phone. 2155 hours. We remotely deactivated the phones in O.J.'s house, but not in the guest house area. I gave Speedy, Blade, 
and the grip the OK to switch Broncos. 2201 to 2203 hours. Our frequency scanner picked up some very short cellular phone calls from OJ, and we spotted him with a phone in his hand. 2204 to 2205 hours. OJ picked up a golf club and began taking some practice swings. I thought of all times why when we're trying to move the Bronco. Hold everything, I exclaimed. There's blood on his left hand. I saw it when he brought the club back. He just hit the ball out of his yard. This infrared lens is worth its weight in gold. Blade, make sure you plant a little blood and lose the left glove at Bundy. It's corny, but it came just in the nick of time. Realizing he couldn't switch the Broncos with O.J. chipping golf balls, Blade switched the license, license plates instead. 2205 hours. It was Thumper again. Hey, Nicole just came out of the house and talked to some guy in a white truck. Now she's heading back inside. Something else, too. I can't explain it, but it's really spooky. It's too damn quiet. There's almost a clammy feeling to the air, like Mother Nature knows some people are going to die and wants to set the mood. Man, it gives me the creeps, unquote. 2206 hours. The little old lady was back with the dog again. This time I focused in on her. Damn, I thought, she looks Mexican. Another impure race, unquote. 2212 hours. Blade pulled into the alley behind Bundy in our identical white Bronco with O.J.'s three CWZ-788 plates affixed. Blade relayed to Thumper, quote, Some big black nigger just walked in the back gate. When my lights hit him, he moved a lot faster. Something familiar about him, but I can't place him, unquote. 2213 hours. Blade, move it. The Jew just parked on Dorothy and he's heading up the sidewalk, unquote, whispered Thumper into his communicator. I'll be there to greet him, replied Blade. Once you're inside, I'll swing around and stand lookout in the back. The enforcer will cover the front, unquote, promised Thumper. 2213 hours. Simpson stopped his chipping, and now he's walking outside to the Bronco, unquote. I couldn't believe his nervous energy. 2214 hours. Blade took off his short-sleeved shirt, walked up a couple of steps, and moved down a canyon-like walkway formed by a rather high wooden fence on the left and Nicole's condo wall on the right. He climbed over a gate, similar to the front gate, about 20 feet down the walkway toward the front. The walkway area provided excellent security from the back alley, because the gate is recessed several feet. Blade placed a folding ladder, the type which folds down to a couple of feet and opens several feet more, against the back gate. He was over in seconds. The Akita came, from around, the cor- came-, the Akita came around the corner from the front and started towards him. The dog started to bark. Blade quickly silenced him with a tranquilizer dart. He then opened the back gate, allowing Speedy to enter. They jammed a small wood sliver into the lock mechanism, preventing it from closing, then brought the ladder inside. Blade quickly moved to conceal himself against a tree in the small patio patio area near the front gate. A small light near the doorway cast an eerie glow on the scene. 2216 hours. Ron Goldman pushed the intercom button. Nicole told him she would be right down to unlock the gate. By the way, I would note in the Legacy of Deception book book by Stephen Singular, there is a reference to a uh, sliver of wood that played a uh, role in the uh, scenario. It is uh, not discussed in the Stephen Singular book, because nobody knew perhaps that was this piece of wood uh, used to uh, jam the lock mechanism on the gate. Continuing, 2216 hours, Ron Goldman pushed the intercom button. Nicole told him that she would be right down to unlock the gate. Blade was behind a tree in the patio patio area. Dressed in the dark jumpsuit, complete with O.J.'s ski cap, he was invisible to Goldman. Yet he could watch him through squinted eyes. Speedy froze into a position in the walkway from which he would handle Nicole. 2216 hours. He's driving into the fortress, just took some stuff out of the Bronco and carried it into the house. Here he comes back, here he comes back again. Back into the Bronco, and now he's driving back out. Phew! He's finally parked it on Rockingham, unquote, I observed. 2219 hours. O.J. finally used up his restless energy and went into the house. The upstairs light went on. I put the van in gear and slowly eased it towards sunset. 2220 hours. Nicole stepped out of her front door, leaving it open. She glanced about, probably looking for her dog while she walked down the steps. She went straight for the gate. Speedy quickly slipped in behind her, and delivered a savage blow to her head. He later told me he put all of his hate into it. She went down whimpering. He grabbed her as she started to fall. 22-21 hours. I notified Grip, 
that I spotted a stretch limo moving pretty fast coming up sunset. Grip remarked, quote, He's too early. He's got to go to the Ashford Gate because that's where the call box is. But his telephone instructions said 360 Rockingham. And then an expletive, I've got to move the Bronco so there can't be an alibi, unquote. 22-21 hours. Blade swiftly opened the gate on a startled Ron Goldman whose mouth was wide open. He faced a 45 caliber Glock with a silencer. Blade motioned him inside. The large weapon and Blade's fiery stare instilled absolute fear. Blade pulled the gate almost closed behind him for security and to visually shield all of them from the sidewalk. 22-22 hours. Grip moved the Bronco to Westboro, one block north of Ashford. 22-22 hours. The enforcer who was on lookout on Bundy radioed the team, We've got company, a man and a woman, look like yuppies coming down Bundy, unquote. 22-22 hours. Blade whispered to Goldman that he better keep his mouth shut or everybody's dead, unquote. Speedy muffled Nicole's little cries with his gloved hand. 22-24 hours. The couple was passed. Speedy dragged Nicole over to the bottom of the step area and dropped her on the ground. They had to maintain visual contact on her as they dealt with Goldman. 22-25 hours. The limo driver, rushing, almost went past the Rockingham gate. At the last minute, he spotted the 360 on the curb, made a ride onto Ashford, pulled a U-turn, came back to the Rockingham gate, and now he's parked on, quote, observed grip. 22-27 hours. Even with the Glock in his gut, Goldman got more and more agitated as he watched Nicole, who was now writhing on the ground and gasping from the pain. At first, he must have thought it was a robbery because he pulled off his ring and handed it to Blade. When Blade motioned for him to drop it, he probably thought for sure this was a drug hit. Blade asked him, drugs in the envelope? Let's have it. Goldman started to mumble, then handed it to Blade. Blade tore the edge, peered in, and with a look of disappointment saw the pair of glasses Thumper had mentioned earlier. Dropping them, dropping them to, the, to the ground, he laughed, then growled, No one's going to see anything, unquote. Looking down at the envelope that had just landed, just landed, Blade noticed the words, Prescription glasses for Nicole Simpson will pick up Monday. Too bad you didn't follow the instructions, unquote. Goldman pleaded, Drugs? Are you looking for Faye? That's Nicole, and she doesn't use drugs, unquote. 2231 hours. Speedy grabbed Goldman from behind, and placed one hand over his mouth and his knife against his throat in one quick movement. He gave Goldman a non-verbal warning to stay quiet and still by deftly cutting him across his throat two times. Very shallow cuts. Goldman's eyes opened really wide. Blade, standing facing him, taunted him by jabbing at him with his knife. 22.33 hours. Goldman began to flail with his hands and fists, landing a few blows on Blade's forearms, pissing him off. 22.35 hours. Grip reported the limo headed back down Ashford and then stepped just past the Ashford gateway, gate, the Ashford gate driveway. He said it looked like the driver was waiting for someone to come out. 22.36 hours. Blade focused his attention back on Nicole. He put on his OJ mask as she started to rise. Lying on her side, dazed and panting, she saw Blade coming at her. Leaning on her left arm, she tried to evade him by pushing herself up and back against the wall, raising her right arm and hand to defend herself. He jabbed at her repeatedly and rapidly, cutting her hand and sticking her in the scalp, all the while taunting her, calling her white P expletive deleted meat for niggers, unquote. He flopped over on her, she flopped over on her knees, bringing her left hand up only to have it nicked in the fury of Blade's jabs. 2237 hours. Blade stepped behind her and clamped his hand over her mouth. He leaned over her. With his masked face close to her ear, he whispered, You better not shout, you better not cry, or your mud children are dead. Unquote. Again, bear in mind they are all in uh, instant uh, communication with each other. Still, that is to say the, uh, the hit teams, still she tried to crawl up her condominium steps with Blade hanging on for dear life. She even clawed at his hand over her mouth. Blade had had enough. He swept her legs out from under her and kneed her hard in the back. She went down on her steps with force. Blade was on top of her. The fall knocked the wind out of her. She was almost immediately up on one knee again, gasping, and Blade was stabbing at her head and neck. 22.38 hours. I reported the lights just went on upstairs in the fortress facing Rockingham, and the limo driver drove first back to Rockingham 
and then up to Ashford again. Grip remarked, damn drivers driving me nuts, unquote. 2240 hours. The limo driver used the intercom. He didn't get an answer, so he went back to the limo. Grip backed the Bronco around and down from Westboro to a spot just south of the Rockingham Gate, out of sight of the limo on Ashford. 2240 hours. Blade grabbed Nicole's hair, pulled back her head, and sliced her throat with all his might, telling her, this will send a message to all the others like you, unquote. At the last moment, he told me, she turned toward him and looked at his, in his masked face. Tears filled her eyes. He could feel her mouthing the word, why, under his hand. That infuriated him. As her body went limp in his arms, Blade ran his hand down her front to her crotch, fingering her briefly through her shift as she twitched. Shame you had to waste it on the niggers, babe, he sneered. Then he let her fall out of the way of Speedy and Goldman, close to the gate. On the ground, her body continued to twitch and jerk. Her eyes, still full of tears, were wide open. Her lower jaw was very slack. Blade kicked her in the back of her legs. Her feet flew forward a foot or so and jammed under the fence when they, where the gate closed. As Blade stepped back, the dog, still under the influence of the tranquilizer, wandered down the walk and started an almost wailing sound. Speedy said he felt sorry for the animal, which wandered off into the street, continuing to wail. 22.41 hours. Nicole's lover ran out of the house. The black guy Blade and Speedy saw before was ranting incoherently. He must have heard the dog or peeked out the front door. Maybe he caught a glimpse of Blade in the OJ mask and was scared out of his jockstrap. Slamming the gate, he took off down the alley and made the turn onto Dorothy, one hell of a runner. He jumped into a vehicle and almost ran over Thumper, who heard the commotion from his watch position on the corner of Dorothy and the alley. 2241 hours. Hearing the gate slam, Blade almost blew the eardrums out of Speedy and me in the van as he shouted, Hey, 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 not thinking of his attached communicator. Now, in a frenzy, Blade returned to face Goldman. He began to chant a taunt. Jew boy's gonna die, Jew boy's gonna die. 22.42 hours. I was back on the radio to, I was on the radio back to him instantly. I demanded to know what the hell's going on, unquote. Silence was my answer. Blade was too involved with his task. I guess Goldman finally realized his life was about to be extinguished. Goldman's hands were cut and bleeding. He started to kick out with his feet, which further infuriated Blade, who sliced his boot and stuck him several times, once in the gut, another in the thigh, and several times in the face. He slashed out at Goldman's legs. Goldman kicked out again, and when Blade moved in to stab him, Goldman caught Blade flush on his left cheek with his fist. It sent Blade reeling. Goldman then tried to grab Speedy with his right hand by lifting it up over his left shoulder, exposing his right side. 22.43 hours. Blade stepped back in and thrust his knife a couple of times into Goldman's now exposed right side between his ribs puncturing a lung. Under crisscross streams from thin beams of waxing moonlight, light from the open door, and the weird sodium vapor street lighting, Speedy and Blade stood fascinated by the, billow, the pillows of what at first appeared to be bright red, then gray-green frothy blood pulsing from his mouth with each heaving breath as his head rolled from side to side. Goldman lost all will to fight. Our scanner picked up a cellular call from the limo. No voice contact. He's keyed in 911. What the F's that about? Do you think he's on to us? Unquote. 2244 hours. For some reason, Blade in the OJ mask got real close to Goldman's ear and whispered to him as he continued to stab him, jabbing, stabbing, and finally cutting his throat in a final crucifying gesture. 2245 hours. Blade and Speedy sat the dying Goldman down against a tree and the fence, propped up so he could see Nicole's lifeless body bathing in an ever-widening pool of blood, even as a broad collar of his own blood oozed down his shirt and chest. Suddenly, Speedy began stopping and stomping on Goldman, cursing up a storm. One protective shoe boot he tore and hung off his foot. He tore it off and stepped back right on the envelope containing the glasses. 2246 hours. Blade radioed that the task was complete and briefly explained his outburst. Quote, we're wrapping it up now so you can relax, but better start the banging now without the glove. We'll plant it later. Copy, unquote, Blade requested. And uh, then the rest of the pass, the rest of uh, this passage describes... Uh, how they planted uh, the blood at uh, O.J.'s and Nicole's, 
And uh, the other evidence, the watch cap, the glove, etc., they put a, took a pool cue with a plastic bag and uh, stuck it through a chain-link fence, and that's how they planted the glove behind the uh, behind Cato's, the guest house in which Cato was staying. And that basically is how the operation was accomplished. That is how, according to this informant, Nicole and Ron died. And that also concludes this segment and this series. Again, uh, the book, Blood Oath by Stephen Worth and Carl Jaspers. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening.